Recognized. Uncle Walker, D. Zero. One. Recognized. Dr. Andrea Letamendi, D. Three. Eight. Hello, team. Today in the Watchtower, we are excited to welcome Dr. Andrea Letamendi. Dr. Letamendi is a licensed clinical psychologist, a writer, a TEDx speaker, and consultant providing seminars and workshops, as well as guesting on panels at universities, mental health agencies, and pop culture events like San Diego Comic-Con, WonderCon, Nerd Night, and Geek Week. She's appeared as a guest on Al Jazeera English, CNN, and Geek and Sundry, and was a commentator on the documentary film Necessary Evil, Supervillains of DC Comics. Dr. Litamendi is also the co-host and co-creator of the brilliant Arkham Sessions podcast, where she and her co-host break down episodes of Batman the Animated Series and analyze the psychology of the villains, heroes, and classic story arcs of this groundbreaking show. Dr. Litamendi, it's an honor to welcome you to Whelmed. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics, and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, please consider this your warning. In addition, we may be discussing a little bit of Batman the Animated Series, so if you haven't seen all that by now, you should probably go fix that as well. (laughs) And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in the uh, intro, Dr. Letamendi, but tell me, tell us a little bit more about who you are and kind of what you do in the world. Yeah, of course. Well, first, thank you for having me on the show. I'm officially whelmed. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I am, as you mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist. I currently work at UCLA uh, as the Associate Director of Health Training Intervention and Response. So I work very closely with uh, a lot of colleagues in student affairs, and we support the well-being of students through programming, through training, through um, a lot of interesting educational opportunities, as well as something called Geek Week, which is kind of like a campus Comic-Con. I also have, as you mentioned, a podcast, and we dedicate our podcast to the psychology of Batman. We primarily focus on single episodes of Batman the Animated Series and like the the entire expanded collection of that, um, which includes the adventures of Batman and Robin and the new adventures. So we, um, we actually have a about a hundred and I think we're 118, 119 episodes at this point. So we've, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so as a psychologist, the challenge uh, was, you know, can we, uh, can we have a launching or a starting point with an episode and then lift up the psychological science and talk about some interesting, fascinating, and even realistic aspects of that episode and uh, the challenge was like, will I ever run out of things to talk about? And honestly, after over a hundred episodes, uh, we still have plenty to talk about. Like yeah. Mental health, psychology, the brain, behavior, personalities. Uh, and it's, it's really to the, to the credit of such an amazing, as you mentioned, groundbreaking show that, uh, that I discovered when I was 12 years old. Nice. Well, uh, for for our listeners who uh, we had Quinn Wilson on uh, at very early on in one of our discussion sessions uh, talking about the use of linguistics and psychology in storytelling, which was Quinn was amazing and fast, just fascinating conversation. And people who love that conversation, it's basically the psychology of storytelling and psychology in the real world presented with Batman, the animated series, because you talk, you do talk a lot about mental health and about kind of how this, this works. But if you're a writer and a creator, uh, then listening to this is going to help you get literally almost figuratively, but getting in the head of the characters that you're trying to write and create. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we did think, you know, initially we started somewhat, I wouldn't say with a basic premise, but we started with some of the most crucial questions that come up about Batman and psychology, which is, you know, what's going on with the Joker? What mental health <laughs> right. do you have? Um, is Batman, uh, is, is he completely self-destructive to the point that he has a mental illness or a mental health problem? And um, and while those were good discussions, over time, we we really were able to branch those questions out and evolve the discussions to be what I would consider very thought provoking and meaningful, more in depth conversations about every behavior and every functioning so that it moved away from, well, what is the name of the diagnosis that this character had? Right, While right. Fascinating. It still doesn't give us uh, much information. It still doesn't really allow us to think of, well, how does this apply 
to my life and and what what does this tell me about how I've been relating to other people and how I've been thinking about my own functioning and my own wellness. Yeah. So we we do have some helpful conversations about um you know what what the DSM is and and why we have um these diagnoses and what those presentations like. But my podcast isn't for psychologists necessarily. It's not necessarily for mental health practitioners. Right, right. This podcast is for everybody and um we really wanted to make sure that we um, can have meaningful and um, I, what I would consider um, helpful discussions that are love of these characters. And we have so right. much fun doing it. It sounds like, so So, what you guys do on your show, the, I have to give a shout out to our listeners, Matt Tennyson, mutual listeners, and uh, Gothic Jacobo. Gothic Jacobo actually connected us through Twitter, and but I first heard of your show through Matt Tennyson, uh, he had been listening to our show and he was like, oh my gosh, you guys, if you haven't heard Arkham Sessions, you need to go listen. Cause you guys are like paralleling in many ways. And, uh, but what I find interesting here, well, one of the many things I find interesting here, we try to encourage the people who listen to our show who want to be creators to do that creation and to do so by writing the stories that only you can create, create whatever material it is that only you can create. I want to read the thing that is unique to you in the things that you combine and bring together. And Arkham Sessions is that of you, right? You have the, you're 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 a you're a doctor, and you're also a fan of these characters, and you've taken those those two loves, and you've managed to create something powerful and unique and interesting that can reach a broader audience for both, you know, people who are in the mental health field and 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 cross those streams. And you you talk a little bit about this. Uh, with your TED talk too, right? About kind of where you fit in the geekdom and the medical industry and that kind of thing as well. Yeah. So um, a few years ago, I was asked to give a TED talk on my personal experiences with my profession and my passion for comics and superheroes. And um, I haven't really shared this part of it. When I first submitted my draft. Um, if folks have ever done TED Talks or TEDx Talks before, usually there's a process where you submit a draft, you do a version of your talk and you get some feedback. Um, that's usually what's um, what creates a really good final TED presentation. Right. Some talks are very polished. Some have been done before. Mine was, not, I, I was asked to create whole new material basically. And the first, uh, the first version, I got feedback that was like, um, this is interesting. Like Batman's interesting. You talk about Batman, you talk about the characters in, in this animated series show, you talk about the fascination you have with the Joker and with the Riddler and with Two-Face, Clayface. They're all really fascinating things, but what does this have to do with you? You don't talk about yourself at all. Mm. Then I realized like, oh, there's a huge psych psychological block with talking about myself because what I had to what I had to do was really explore and better understand the relationship that I have with the show and with these mm. things. Mm -hmm. Growing up, my identity was very much kind of wrapped into loving Batman and loving these characters. I was hooked on the animated series and then I moved on to comic books. And then when I was in college and then in graduate school, I basically um, stopped believing that I could be a professional person in this field that I was pursuing and like comics, which was all of this uh -huh. internal, it was an mm -hmm. internal, you know, um, mm -hmm. self-imposed, very rigid idea. Like you can't be a perfect, you can't get a PhD and be in this profession and be taken seriously. I'm relating to everything you're saying right now on so many levels. Yes. Imagine if you're doing rounds or you're, you're working with patients, you're treating patients and you know, they see that you have a Batman tattoo or that you right comic books in your, in your locker or whatever. So, you know, at the time this was, um, I would say, uh, when this, when I was uh, going through the struggle, it was it was definitely several years ago. So it was uh, about I would say like two or three years of struggling with this this like this internal struggle, and then um, something happened when I I was uh, doing some consultation with DC Comics, and one of the issues of Batgirl actually included me 
as a character. I was going to bring that up. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people wonder how that happened. So what I was doing is during graduate school, I was um, writing about superheroes and psychology and talking about mental health and how these characters um, can give us some insight and give us some um, some really great lessons about um, about resilience and about trauma and about overcoming challenges. And uh, that led to doing consultations for some writers. And that led to um, this wonderful relationship with Gail Simone, where she was writing this recovery story for Barbara Gordon. And she was um, including in, in this recovery story, psychological treatment in the form of psychosocial counseling. And so when she included me as a character in that story, <laughs> I, I was very surprised. And um, in my TED talk, I think I describe it as like my 12 year old self kind of like couldn't wrap yes. her head around this. How amazing. Yeah. And I think that's sort of the turning point for me. Like, Oh, um, what, what if the knowledge about mental health and psychology could actually um, be useful in the world of comics? And conversely, what if I utilize the amazing stories that inspired me as a kid to help people understand mental health and psychological psychological science a little bit better? And that led to, of course, the podcast and um, speaking at Comic Con, doing panels at Comic Con, mm -hmm. universities and wellness conferences. And um, I've really embraced now this part of my identity as being very <laughs> intertwined with comics and superheroes. Um, but I kind of had to go through that journey of realizing that the the struggle there was understanding that I was very ashamed of this part of my identity and unsure if I would be accepted as a as a professional, whatever that image is. Um, right. And so what's important to me now is that I um, that I'm very uh, open about my identity and my passion for comics and superheroes and animated series like like the ones that we we love because um, that's when I'm my authentic self and that's when I can be the most helpful to other people. I adore everything about that story. And I am so glad that you came on the show and talked about that because I think this is an important thing. We have a lot, we have a wide range of people listening to our show, wide range of ages. My co-host Emily walked into a comic book store for the first time after watching Young Justice and becoming intrigued by these stories. We have our first discussion guest uh, was Darcy Ross, who came on to talk about being a new fan of this particular show and and how she realized these things had more to offer her um, as, a, as a woman, as a woman of science. Like, there's so much more to be offering from these stories. They're not what, when I was a kid in the 70s and early 80s, like, were real condemned. And, and I can relate to so many aspects of what you're talking about, about this need to feel like a professional. And the lesson of being able to learn how to be the most authentic you is the you that could be the most helpful. That quote that you just did. Amazing. And I hope people carry, I think if there's anything to carry away so far, that's it. Be you. Absolutely. And I didn't know it at the time, but when we're not our authentic selves, we, um, we have this internal tension and this self doubt. For me, it was imposter syndrome, right? The yeah. That, um, I already doubted whether I should be in a PhD program, whether I'm going to be effective as a mental health professional, whether I can offer um, a, a meaningful therapeutic relationship or participate in the scientific field. I already had doubts about that. And I think what's helpful for me to do now is to be very present and to be visible. Because yeah. I'm also a woman of color. So yeah. just from the starting point, I knew that um, I wasn't going to have the same expectations that other people had. And I already felt that I should be presenting myself as um, this perfect image of what a professional needs to look like. Yeah. What's, what's weird, what's, or what's interesting, I guess, is that like, well, what, what a professional looks like is what we decide it looks like. Yes. <laughs> so um, it's now it's kind of, uh, it's reparative and it's really exciting to just be myself and acknowledge that, yeah, I'm, I'm a Star Wars and Batman geek and this is just who I am and, and it's what I use in my practice and what I use in my work. 
Mm -hmm. um, it's great to see young people and students see that and realize that they could also, whether it's this passion or another type of fandom mm -hmm. or another part of the, the, their identity, that they can be um, their authentic selves and then yeah. create that narrative as, um, as a true professional. If you have that passion for something, whatever that passion happens to be, in this case with a lot of our listeners, obviously, is Young Justice, you can use that as a springboard for any of the other things that you want to do. And listening to your show, like, so to shift gears just a smidge. So the first episode of Arkham Sessions that I listened to was this fascinating analysis and somewhat disturbing episode of Baby Doll and Killer Croc. <laughs> yes. So I'm listening to this episode and I'm hearing you guys like banter. I'm like, as a storyteller and a writer and a fan of the show and a fan of superheroes, I'm like loving the banter. You're talking about breaking down the story itself and what did they do and what, what happened previously with Baby Doll in the series and kind of how that was written into this current one and, and set up these storylines. I love that part. And then you get to the end, the end of the episodes, and you just like are let off the hook for the psychology and you just go in and as a, as a medical professional myself, as, as a nurse, I'm like fascinated because though I deal with people uh, as a hospice nurse and as a former ICU nurse, I deal with people in different stages of health, right? Mental and physical health. I'm still not in any way an expert in your, in the field that you have. So it's like, I'm listening to everything I like to geek out about short of marine biology buried in your well actually killer croc was in this one so kind of touched on that as well so <laughs> listening in these episodes that baby doll killer croc episode was really bizarre and i don't remember it being that bizarre but like watching it like 20 years later when i'm older i'm just like this is interesting <laughs> they're like a couple she's a full she's like an adult person but she's because of her um she has this medical condition so she's sort of trapped in this child's body he's killer croc so he's giant uh, monstrous yeah but they form this um really twisted relationship and uh yeah it's interesting to go back and look at some of the episodes i mean old wounds i think that's the one where mm -hmm. batman is essentially like punching this guy in the face in front of his young child yeah and so we talk about what what that whole dynamic is and his motivation to demonstrate such violence and brutality in front of a youth. Right. What his goal of do, like we we really almost argued about like why did he do this? Yeah. Whose benefit and and so to go back uh for me the show the animated series really towed the line and really introduced some some dark tones and you know visually as well as in terms of writing and really pushed the boundaries as far as some of the stories go and so it's really fun to go back to those episodes and mm -hmm. talk about like the craziness of it but also then to try and think like okay so like weird crazy episode but what can we learn from that how can we take this dynamic this relationship this trauma um, you know, this accident, uh, what, what can we do with this starting point and then give our listeners something interesting to think about moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and for those who don't remember, cause there's so many episodes, old wounds is the one that explores the, the idea of why did Dick Grayson become Nightwing and leave Bruce? It's the episode we talk about on the show periodically where Dick punches Bruce in the face and, and takes off. And part of the reason was because he, he's kind of, he's chasing this criminal and, and intimidating him, but he's doing so in front of like a child, his child. And Dick is like, this is not okay. And then, you know, this is when um, it's made very clear that Barbara and Bruce and Dick like know that she's Batgirl and, you know, he's Robin and et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot going on in that episode, but it's the one we refer to periodically because Greg Weissman had actually was talking to us online about, how he decided to change or decided to represent the Batman in Young Justice a little differently and that he never really understood why Dick and Bruce needed to have such an antagonistic relationship. And we get a, we get a vision of that in one of the two episodes we wanted to talk about today, which is fail safe and disordered. And in, so just as a real quick reminder for people who may need, may need it, um, in failsafe is when Martian Manhunter puts a team in like this matrix like simulation to see how they can handle a no win, violent alien invasion scenario. But during the mission, Artemis dies 
uh, of course it's a simulation, but Miss Martian's subconscious doesn't register that hijacks the simulation and then every, everybody dies. It's just, everyone dies. <laughs> and then in, in disordered, uh, the subplot of disordered includes the team meeting with black canary one-on-one to process kind of the fallout. So we're going to kind of freeze of conversation. We're going to talk about them as if there were almost like one episode, right? But in that episode, Dick, because he led the team during the everybody dies mission <laughs> and it's the first mission he's led with this team in young justice. Uh, he says there's a thing that drives Batman. And I'm now understanding that I do not have that thing that drives Batman. And I do not want to kill a part of myself or sub or subdue a part of myself in order to become that thing that he is. I don't, I want to be a hero. I don't want to be the Batman anymore. And in a later episode, we find out that that's not what Bruce wanted for him in the first place, but he just, they've never had that conversation because Bruce is talking about how he knew all along that Captain Marvel was a 10 year old and on the Justice League and Wonder Woman calls him out and says, why didn't you tell us? And he's like, because he's a member of the league. What is it? You know, it, I knew the whole time. And Wonder Woman's like, that shouldn't surprise me. You brought Robin into crime fighting at the ripe old age of nine. And he said, yeah, he needed closure. Robin needed closure. He needed to find the men who killed his parents. And she says, so he could become like you. And Batman's response is, so that he wouldn't. And in that, in that discussion that you guys had about old wounds, this kind of comes up in the discussion you have about this idea of why is the Batman and the Batman the Animated Series? What's the clear story about him adopting these kids? It seems like it should be that Bruce is trying to help Dick not become him. <laughs> but in that episode, Old Wounds, it's like really fluid. It's a little hard to tell. It's the Batman in it, the Bruce Wayne in it is almost not my favorite. The fact that he actually beats up this guy in front of his kid, it's one of the few episodes that's kind of like, oof, buddy, like that's that's a little bit much. I don't know if that's really the you I think you are. Yeah. Um, what, one thing that we explore is Bruce Wayne's development over the course of the animated series episodes. And we really struggled with this episode in the sense that we had to, um, well, I had to defend. I'm an apologist and I always say, Batman's doing the best that he can with what he's going through at the time or with what he has at the time, the resources, knowledge, level of functioning he has at the time. It probably goes for anybody. But what I will always try to do is better explain why he would do something that we might consider unhealthy, erratic, um, brutal, right. um, selfish, um, mindless, isolative, <laughs> Self dev, like all like right. I could go on. <laughs> You've got a checklist. <laughs> yeah. So and I always say, like, oh, there's an explanation for this. Here, we did touch upon, I believe, the idea that he let himself go too far, and that yes, he lost control. We did have a dialogue. My my co-host Brian Ward will always bring in kind of the sense of like not the psychologist because that's my role, but more of a layperson, a fan watching the show right. and trying to understand it. And his argument was like. What if he really wanted to to kind of this wasn't necessarily for Robin. This was for that that family that Batman truly needed to end the crime, the uh, crime ridden part of this man's life because this guy was a criminal. He was right. And so he really wanted to, to terminate that part of his life so that his, this family could have a better future. And right. so he did have to make it so dramatic and so brutal. Mm -hmm. um, I. I go back to thinking or revisiting some earlier episodes and maybe to answer your question a little bit, Robin's Reckoning, I think is a two. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Great two-parter. Yeah. Things you're talking about, what is going to be helpful and reparative for Robin and what is Bruce at the time and Robin's Reckoning, essentially Robin has the opportunity to, I believe, to kill um, the man who murdered his parents. Mm-hmm he's discovered them he's back in his life and there's there's almost this turning point for him where he decides he does not go down that route and i think the common thread that even takes us to young justice is that he does not want to be the kind of hero that batman is right in robin's reckoning batman tries to sort of pull him into a world of 
choices and options. And Batman makes it clear that he no longer lives in that world. Like I'm too far gone. I've right. I'm not proud of. I've been in a space psych, psych, psychologically that I cannot get out of. I don't want that future for you. And so right. that's up these um, sort of the environment for Robin to be, I guess, more higher functioning and more um, of a normal kid. That's normal is all really relative. Um, but right. what I like about <laughs> Disordered, um, the episode in which Black Canary is kind of trying to spend one-on-one -on -one time with each of the, the Young Justice members and really trying to better understand how did this tragic, really disruptive experience um, impact them. What I love about that is that each of the members have a different reaction and response. And what's realistic about that is anytime there's any kind of uh, life-threatening situation or trauma, everybody has their own way of responding to it. Is it Superboy who is angry? Mm -hmm. Well, he he starts, well, it looks like he's angry at the beginning and he storms out and Black Canary's first reaction is like, oh, I know you're not supposed to have any feelings. You're supposed to be, you know, tough and on the inside. But then at the end of the episode, we come to find out that isn't why he stormed out and said, you don't understand me. It's not that he was angry. It's that after everyone died, all of his friends died he was happy because he finally understood what his role in the world was to be and what it was to be is to be Superman should he die. And he's like, how do I live with this guilt of being happy after all of my friends were dead? And it makes Superboy such this complex character because because it makes sense. You look at I was watching it. And I'm like going, ah, oh, he's being angst ridden Superboy again. Off he goes. And, you know, he's angry. Yeah, and so you're right. There's um there's layered emotions. The primary emotion is is this um this guilt he's guilty for feeling at peace and happy right kind of fulfilled fulfilled that identity and how that like just thinking about like wow what is it like to feel happy when all of your friends have died or have been traumatized what a mo i mean that writing is just um just really really intense and really good and then other other members are sort of like i'm fine um i got over it <laughs> while he's in denial while he's all she's all you're in denial and he's like i'm good with that <laughs> yeah, it's like that's oh, fine um and uh you know aqualad is uh wrestling with you know am i a good leader did i make the right decision maybe i should resign and someone else should take this spot and he kind of goes through the list of who could be competent in that situation so i find him to be um i mean you can correct me but it seems like this this is an intellectual response to to trauma Oh yeah, I could see that. Auto call. Yeah. What what happens next? I'm not fit for duty. So who you know? So it's sort of like how a soldier might um, might respond. And then of mm -hmm. course Robin's reaction is is really fascinating because he comes to the realization that he does not want to be the hero that Batman is, and he acknowledges that he he's always thought he's supposed to grow up to be Batman, but realizes that he never wants to be in a place where he would have to sacrifice everything for this mission and his moral distress is sort of you know really becoming present which is that he he doesn't think that some uh some missions are worth the lives of of the people that are close to him yeah and the undercurrent of that of course is how he feels about batman's approach to relationships yeah, which is um, a common theme in our show. You know, does Batman actually care about anybody? He does. Does he even care about himself? Because he will put the mission above anybody else, including the people that are close to him. Right. I think that's um, you know that's an interesting examination of a person who is so wrapped up into the morality, um, the rightness, the justice of yeah. The, and that's relatable. I think that's really relatable. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, we're we're gonna uh, I'm I'm gonna refer back to old wounds quite a bit because we number one it's about Dick Grayson. Everybody knows I love Dick, but we're gonna put a link to that in the show notes as well. You guys can go check out um, the Arkham sessions about it. But when you guys were talking about this thing, this this because another part of that episode is the fact that Bruce, that Dick is graduating college, and Bruce isn't there. 
He's off doing something relatively like he's not like stopping Joker from blowing up Metropolis or something. He's just out like on patrol and just decided not to go. It's really strange, but uh, it's it was an interesting contrast because I was we had just got done reviewing the tie-in Young Justice comics uh, that are the the stories in the Young Justice comics that were based on the TV show are are, are tightly woven. It's basically a whole other season of the show. It's tightly woven into the sh- the, the plots of the show. And in one of those, the the last uh, six issue arc is part of that is Dick's. Uh, I want to say it's his fourteenth birthday, and so he turns around and Bruce is there, and he's like, "Oh, I thought you were dealing with Raish in a thing in the Middle East." And he's like, "It can wait. This is imp- this is more important." And there's like there's very specific points in Young Justice and in the comics that are like almost like purposeful little bullet point minor counterpoints he's not warm and cuddly no but he definitely has this thing of like no i i took you in you're my responsibility i'm going to do what i have to do but there are times where that has to be put aside to do this thing right alfred is not by default raising dick alfred's involved but like bruce is there more than i've seen him in any other series yet still manages to pull off being batman (laughs) you know Right. And how does he, you know, one thing he has to, he has to balance is being a mentor to a young person who's, um, who's going to be a super or going to be working with supers, right? Like that relationship is one thing. How do you mentor somebody who's going to enter spaces where their lives are, their life is going to be at risk and the, and people, you know, rest on their decisions. So sort of like that dynamic. And then the other dynamic, which is, He's a kid. And so he has right. raised, he has to be emotionally, psychologically, and intellectually given these lessons beyond, yeah. above and beyond the whole superhero lifestyle, right? So what does that look like? And I I draw back to I draw from the the Lego movie. As silly as that movie was, it was so good. It was way better than it had any right to be. It's so good. <laughs> It addressed uh, the relationship, Robin's need to be parented. Yeah. The basic need to have someone nurture him and acknowledge him and right. um, just to have that that authentic like care for him. And so on the show, I, I will address, I'll ask my co-host like, okay, let's just start. Our starting point is what is this person's basic need or what are their basic needs? And so you can have that as a starting point. If you're ever trying to figure out with a character's dynamic or decisions that they're making, aside from, you know, maybe the writing being kind of crazy, can, can you boil it down to like, well, what, what is their basic need? Because that can help us understand their motivations and their behaviors and the way they're treating other people. Right. And that can, I think, be a good launch pad for understanding the psychology of a character. I agree a hundred percent. And and that was one of the things I wanted to, to chat with you about too. Like when Jason Spizak, the voice of Kid Flash was on the show, there was this phrase he used that I absolutely loved where he said, cause uh, where he said, um, how much credit do the writers and the actors get to have made so many emotional deposits in the bank that you can have a scene that's 15 seconds long and take such an emotional withdrawal out of it. Like, because you've set this, set up these pins, right? Like this whole thing in like fail safe is just a, it's just disaster. Like everybody dies, but it's a dream sequence episode. And in most shows, a dream sequence episode at the end of it resets everything back to zero. But in Young Justice, it changes everything forever. Because even though it wasn't necessarily real, the experiences that they had were still traumatic. Robin still made those decisions and his decisions led to people dying, right? Calder made the decision to act like a soldier instead of a general and he recognizes that and he carries the fact that when I was put into this situation, I made this choice. What does that mean about me? Who am I? What am I as a character? And they carry that character arc change forward. And one of the, I had two questions about writing I wanted to ask you if you, if you have insights into them. One is any advice on laying groundwork to have these punches ahead of time, laying the groundwork ahead of time. And also, do you have any thoughts on an animation or even live action TV series that have this problem where their character learns a lesson in an episode 
or has a traumatic event in an episode, but like six episodes later, it's like it never happened. Like they don't allow their characters to grow and change. Do you have insights on either that kind of before a, before a significant event or after a, after a significant event to make a character more feel more grounded or real? Um, well, addressing the, the second question, I, I do think that it's important to see development over time. So if there is a critical event, I mean, I think that Failsafe is the perfect example of this. You have this life-changing disruption. And so if we were to see, for me, my investment is let's demonstrate something that's realistic and something we can connect to. So if we experience something that's disruptive, potentially traumatic, life-changing, and I see you in a couple weeks as if nothing had changed. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> Medically speaking, I can also back this up. <laughs> the wonderful part of uh, failsafe is that things reset in the sense that like no one actually died, right? So right. lives were reset and wow, we got to simulate a trauma that included death and loss. And it lasted for so long that we then got to simulate grief and that process. And how do we move past grief to c carry this mission? And how do people make decisions? So there's all this great stuff to learn from. Um, but imagine if there was a, a critical event, a sentinel event, and then things were reset in terms of people not developing. And I think that is a, a disservice. If yeah. That's a disservice to their audience because it means anything can happen. And it means that, well, then in the future, when we see really dramatic things happen, why are we going to take that seriously? Exactly. That's how I felt when I saw Failsafe. I was like, oh, that wasn't real. So why does it matter? And then I learned, oh, wow, it did matter. Mm -hmm. This is not something that people are going to recover from, at least not immediately. And so, so I hope that answered the, the question about, uh, you know, what, what would happen if we didn't have uh, the psychological and emotional development? The short answer to that is like, well, real, realistically, we all experience change and reparative processes after those events. Right. So I definitely want to see that in animated um, material. As far as how to create characters and relationships, um, occasionally writers will ask me, um, not not animated series, but um, comic writers, comic book mm. novel writers will ask me about uh, either developing a character or uh, creating a narrative that might involve exposure to trauma or a difficult situation and recovery and maybe some aspect of psychology is is um needed to be addressed and i i try to just uh ask them to build layers from from a, a basic foundation of like well what is how is this character supposed to be and utilize their their initial dynamic and then kind of layer that up based on what they've already experienced how have they um, bounced back or um, been reparative in the past what relationships do they rely on? And then I also tell them not to worry about, well, what is um, the psychology? Like what, you know, whether it's a diagnosis or whether it's uh, some uh, intention to present a certain like clinical presentation. I usually say like, don't get caught up in that. Don't worry too much about how you want to present that because human beings are so complex. Yes. Um, we should never really be just boxed into these categories, especially mm. when it comes to mental health. If someone says, nope, I want to write in PTSD or I want to write in, it's helpful for my audience to know substance abuse, then I say, great, we need more literature that, that talks about that. Here's, here's typically what that presentation looks like. But if you don't need those labels, tell a story and talk about that character in a way that shows some of those struggles, some of those challenges mm -hmm. and their behavioral response in the way that you would envision that they would react and don't get caught up in, but it has to be this certain representation. The wonderful part about their writing is that they can give us representations that 
um, that a lot of people might relate to that isn't a textbook. Right. Well, they deal with so many of these things throughout Young Justice. And just, just speaking of substance abuse, at, you know, Superboy as a clone doesn't have all the powers of Superman because he's spliced with, uh, he's spliced with human DNA. And so he gets the shields, which are the patches that he ends up slapping on himself that Lex Luthor gives him to gives him full Kryptonian powers for a while. There is so much psychology wrapped into the shields, what they represent to him, like these, these patches, the power that it gives him. Is it, is it him trying to get the attention of Superman, who is basically ignoring him all through the first season because he doesn't know how to handle the fact that he suddenly has a 16-year-old clone son? You know, much less the fact that we find out that Superboy's dad is Lex Luthor, the other dad is Lex Luthor. And like Lex is giving him stuff and paying attention to him when Superboy is not. And then he needs to have this power. So he uses the patches and then why he gives them up. And it's all, it's clearly a parallel to an addictive situation, but why he gets into it and how he finds himself there and then gets himself out can nod to or parallel something like a substance abuse situation without having to get, you know, to like, okay, let's, let's go to the, you know, diagnostics and let's go through the, you know, the checklist of medical stuff when he's having a withdrawal. And, you know, you don't need to get into that kind of stuff. You can still echo it, like you were saying, and telling them, like, who's the character? How is the character react to this? As opposed to how does every person put in a box react to this? I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I didn't know that about Lex Luthor. That's interesting. <laughs> There's a lot going on. I know. Uh, so, uh, D Drea, you told me to call you Drea, yeah. So, okay, good. When you get doctor in front of your name, I like to say doctor. Drea was saying earlier that she's she's seen episodes of Young Justice, but hasn't you know seen them all like together in a long time or, or not all together. You've missed episodes, uh, so there's some stuff that she knows and doesn't know. So the spoiler warning was for you too, Drea. Apparently, but um, yeah, there's a lot going on. So, and I, I honestly, I would love to have you on to talk about six different subjects, like. I would like you to come on and talk about how each character's family life is different. Artemis from a broken home, McGann, who's got, you know, who left her whole planet because of, <laughs> ran away from her whole planet because of family issues, Dick being adopted, Wally having a perfectly functional, happy home when all of his friends are whatever, you know, Superboy being in a clone abandoned by his dad. Like, there's so much going on with just talking about the family life. Uh, and Young Justice. But when you're talking about like an, a, um, an ensemble cast like this, balancing that kind of storyline is pretty heavy. So the, the writers that you've talked to and consulted, we love Gail Simone, but like the writers you're talking about, like Gail's writing, there's a lot of characters, but she's writing, say, Batgirl, right? It's about Batgirl, but there are other characters involved. Have you worked with people who are working with teams and and their team dynamics? Or is it more a little bit more about kind of focusing on uh, the the... Sorry, the comics that you've consulted on are about a single character or a couple of characters as opposed to like an ensemble cast? Usually somebody is interested in the mental health presentation or psychology of a character or they're developing a character or developing a story. And um, some of the some of the common questions are, um, well, is this traumatic incident realistic or is this? you know, how would somebody react to this environment or to that scenario or even gotcha. a conflict? But it's a really good question. I have not been asked about team dynamics. Mm -hmm. We did a panel uh, with a group of writers about X-Men and how mm -hmm. X-Men kind of work together and how their individual right. dynamic and their individual psychology and powers are essential to the team's operations. And that was really fascinating because um, we were then able to kind of extend our conversations to more of the uh, the factors uh, about group dynamics and about um, how there's interplay between um, between characters and between personalities. And I mean, that was a lot of fun. That's fantastic. Um, and yeah, because it's so interesting to me that, you know, there's so many shows that are like Arrow or Flash where there's a there's a team like there's people there. There's more than just the one character, but it's really focused on mostly the one character where uh, a show like, say, Justice League, the animated series. Right. Or Justice League Unlimited or Young Justice has this, you know, world full of characters that they're dealing with and, and working with and how they work. Um, the episode in Justice League Unlimited where Captain Marvel joins the team. Shazam joins the team and he's a, he's a little kid 
that he then sees Superman, who he had looked up to the whole time, and Superman in that particular episode is not acting as heroic as he probably could. And uh, and Shazam calls him out on it, and that psychology of uh, meeting your heroes and how that affects things. And, you know, in, in Young Justice, when when Bruce Wayne is sitting Clark Kent down in a diner and get lecturing him about parenting advice, you know, like there's just, there's so much stuff that can be going on that doesn't have anything to do necessarily. The show's called Young Justice. It's very specifically about, you know, focused on the team, but it's really the entire DC universe and the ability to juggle each dynamic with each other, because there's such, like you were saying at the beginning, like there's such this rich, like a uh, palette of characters that we get to draw from. So that was something I was thinking about as well when they first did it, because I, I, I mean, I was like, oh, this Black Canary is fantastic. I love this version of Black Canary, and Vanessa Marshall is an incredible voice actress. So I was like, well, this, this, this tracks, it makes sense. But it wasn't until season two, I don't know if you've seen the episodes, but there's some kids who get kidnapped, and when they're recovered, they go through the same kind of one-on-one -on -one sessions with Black Canary. It's not exactly the same, but we get to see, like, Static Shock, right? is one of the characters. He's a kid, he gets kidnapped, he comes back, now he has he has powers that he doesn't understand and he's he's talking to to Black Canary. When I'm like this is this is Dinah's thing. This is in, in the Young Justice universe, I am 100% convinced that she is a therapist in real life. And this is why they they put her in this position. She used to be like a florist and she had done some other things in the comics, had some other professions, but I'm like no. And it's and it makes me so happy <laughs> that she is like trained in this and is just she's just such a good character i was actually you know going to ask you why she is the counselor or in the counselor role for this team um, mm -hmm. i can think of many reasons why her just her personality and her experience and and yeah uh, how she how she interacts with them is really comforting and supportive. She calls them out. She's, she doesn't, you know, uh, when it comes to addressing certain emotions, she, she really is a, a straight shooter, but why, why her as opposed to other characters? I don't know. I, and I think, I think it's because in the back of his head, Greg Weissman or Brandon Vietti have decided that she's a actually trained therapist that's the only that's the only thing i think of i mean in addition to that you want to have this the conservation of characters you already have a ensemble cast and i mean if, the, the, if they use icon the character of icon and icon is a lawyer so in season two they need a lawyer they're drawing on icon right and so they're they're not going to create a, a new character necessarily and i'm trying to think if there's any other character on this like group of the justice league that is a therapist and a hero, and I can't think of anyone. So I think she just—I think she just fits the role well. And the the scene where she's where she's talking to to McGann, Miss Martian, and Miss Martian's like, "I don't want to use my powers anymore." And she's like, "Yeah, I tried that once. <laughs> it didn't it didn't work out well." <laughs> I think she said something like, "I I chose to to be silent." Yeah, I chose to not talk after the first time. Oh, her canary cry. She's like, I almost completely deafened my first grade class or something. Right. Um, and yeah. Powerful. I, as a, as a psychologist, I'm always pleased when I see characterizations and um, portrayals that do not do a disservice to my field. Yeah. I feel you. Yeah. They were in, um, they were in comfy chairs. It wasn't as if one person was lying down and the other person was behind them, which is really an outdated method. <laughs> her eye level, this right. all, all, just, and even her technique was really um, effective and very like cognitive behavioral. Everything was, was great about that. And, and no one had to say like, well, she has a license and you know, like they didn't need to do that. Right. What I, it was clear. This is a debriefing. This is yeah. a session to address this incident and to individually right. assess how people are doing. And I love that. And I love when I see the, the portrayal like that be realistic and not about the whole environment, not about like, well, let's put a lab code and let's like, no, it's about the dialogue and it's about the process and it's about mm -hmm. the characters. And I love that. Yeah. They did a lot of showing, not telling. She just did, she just did the job. And did it really, really well. And I, I agree with you. The same thing happens with nursing. I joke, the, the best nurse I've ever seen on screen is Baymax from Big Hero 6. 
He's the best nurse I've ever seen on screen, except for the fact that he tries to to defib somebody without actually scanning them first. That's not a good idea. But uh, other than that, yeah, so I hear you. And, and that was one of the things I was curious about because I was so taken for so many reasons and so many levels by 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 Disordered and these, these meetings and how um, Andrew Robinson, the writer, wrote them. And I was like, is it just me? Is it is it me watching CSI and not being an actual crime scene investigator and believing that little magic blue light exists? Or is it actually as good as it looks like? And it sounds like they did a good job. They did. They did. And and I appreciated that I would say a third to a half of that episode is about those sessions. Yeah. They have to do that. They could have just been they could have had like, you know, one or two lines about some people being avoidant and defensive yeah. other people being angry other, but they right. they gave us these counseling sessions what a treat like that was a good amount of the i would say those were the grounding that was the core because other stuff happened with the new genesis folks came in and yep and and all that has to do with stuff that comes up later in the new genosphere and like it's laying groundwork like there's there's no there's no loose strings in young justice every single thing happens for a reason part of the thing too which is interesting to me from a watching standpoint is you know the the fourth world and the new genosphere stuff can look really kind of silly over the top which is almost like a bit of a relief from the intensity of the of the therapy sessions and fail safe having been so intense as well. But it also is about Superboy's change and growth. Like from the very first episode, I saw Superboy and I was like, Oh man, I'm gonna have to watch angsty Superboy for like five seasons. It's going to drive me crazy. But by like five episodes in, you're like, Oh, I'm already seeing change. And then you see this kind of depth of personality and character defining moment. And then in addition to that, the reason why he comes back is because he's ready to like share and listen. And in that episode, he was like, I guess I'm the expert. So I guess I have to be a leader. I can't be a weapon. I can't be a hero. I have to help these people. Like, I just got to be me instead of trying to be something I think I'm supposed to be. And then in, in season two, it's, it's just he's an almost entirely different character. And that character growth is just so brilliant and beautiful, right? And so few shows allow their characters to grow like that because it's like, oh, well, if everybody loves angsty Superboy, we're not going to change that because we got toys to sell or whatever, you know, and um, or, or just want to have people come back every season. But after a while, it's like, OK, we've learned this lesson 15 times and he's still not learned it. Right. Also, it's the kind of show that you should watch from the beginning and progress through this. You know, I, mm -hmm. I would probably say the first couple seasons of, of uh, Batman, the animated series, you can just grab any of those episodes in any right way, for the most part um yeah and uh it's they're brilliant and episodic absolutely but young justice is is not like that at all no not at all to the point where we we started the podcast for therapy because we needed to actually just talk about how brilliant the show was and how no one was doing anything like it and uh you know and that's been pretty successful for us so far hopefully some of our listeners as well um, but uh, any final thoughts you have to add in on, on at least failsafe and disordered, at least this particular section? Because I, I bet we're going to invite you back for pretty much anything else you want to talk about. <laughs> well, not necessarily related to this show, but certainly in general, we sometimes struggle with with our podcast to find something to talk about when it comes to psychology. We always land somewhere. It doesn't sound like you're struggling to me. It sounds no. Well, I would say that when we the method that we use is we. Um, I've seen most of the episodes of the animated series and and the expansion of, of that collection when I was younger. And what we do is we re maybe you do this as well. We revisit it. We rewatch it, and then we kind of discuss it a little bit, and then kind of do our little research. My co-host does research on some of the character development, like where have we seen these characters before. I'll do research on well, what is the psychological science that I can kind of lift up out of the episode and, and focus on and talk about like, what are the one or two things that I can tell people about? And sometimes that process includes a struggle around, uh, well, well, do people want to learn about torture? Do they want to learn about brain trauma? Oh, oh, right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The most recent episode we did was about Etrigan, who's a demon and just yeah. kind of like, once you once you have bonded or paired with him, he then does whatever you tell him to. 
And that episode, I think it's called The Demon Within, is really um, just kind of uh, schlock. Like it's just the fighting and the, you know, oh, right. Overcome this demon. There's not a lot of psychology. But what I ended up talking about was compliance and obedience. And in this case, nice. even though Etrigan the demon does whatever you tell him, and that's the, you know, he, they figured it all out by the end of the episode. Um, what it raised as far as an idea is why did he do everything they told him to do? He was being asked to do really destructive, violent, inhumane things. Why didn't he turn around and say, no, I'm not going to do this thing. I'm not going to be abusive. I'm not going to be violent. I'm not going to be immoral. And so we had a discussion about intelligent disobedience, which is, I believe you must encounter this kind of scenario all the time. When do we say no? When the system or the job or the government or uh, our, somebody tells us to do something because it's part of our job or it's the expectation or it's the law and we decide, but it's not right. Mm -hmm. Do we turn around and do that? And um, it's not as clear cut as you think. It sneaks up on you. Yeah. And uh, so we had the discussion and we didn't have the, the right answer to it, but we at least were able to talk about something that was uh, realistic. And I would say maybe something more connecting than like, oh, well, uh, otherwise we'd be talk talking about a demon. Like, that's not really <laughs> right. Right. The work that I do. Um, right. So, so I think uh, that's my roundabout way of saying as soon as I saw fail safe and disordered, I immediately. I was um, just so full of joy and ideas and and had such a positive reaction to the great writing and also to the to the brilliance and the willingness to put in such a devastating thing and to show characters go through mm -hmm. reactions and um, and the variety and uh, diversity of all the different psychological reactions. I thought that was great. I 100% agree with you. Um, medically speaking, we have a bit of an echo from my ICU time and, and my hospice time, which is that line between prolonging life and prolonging passing gets is really hard to see. <laughs> so when you're in an ICU, we're constantly trying to prolong things as long as possible. But sometimes, uh, you know, the the hospital, the the families together, you know, whatever it happens to be, we kind of overshoot that line before we're like, okay. Now we're just now we're just getting in the way of a natural body process of of letting someone go, and it's it, you'd think it would be like oh well you just know and I'm like no you don't necessarily and you need to be aware of that so you don't either beat yourself up because you're not making that decision when you think you were supposed to have, um, but also be aware of it so that you know that this is a question it's not going to be obvious so you need to look out for it and be aware of it so. I have way too much more stuff I want to talk about. We're going to have to uh, have you back uh, after you've watched uh, a few more episodes and see what kind of stuff that you want to talk about, particularly when you hit second season and see some of the uh, entertaining dynamics that happen then as well. Um, so thanks so much for spending some time with us in the Watchtower, Drea. Where can people find you out on Earth Prime? So people can find me on Twitter at Arkham Asylum Doc is the best way to have an interaction with me, ask me questions, find my stuff. My uh, website is underthemaskonline.com. You can find the Arkham Sessions podcast episode uh, episodes there. And then Instagram, where I have um, lots of stuff with uh, comics, Comic-Con, Batman, Cats. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, the same handle. It's Arkham Asylum Doc. And you're going to be at Comic-Con. This air episode is going to air after San Diego Comic-Con. But you have, a, you have a pretty interesting panel at Comic-Con that will probably be showing up on your show, yeah? We're so excited because we're joined by Lauren Lester, who, of course, is the voice of Robin. And mm -hmm. we will be talking about the psychology of Robin and um, Dick Grayson in particular through the lens of what I do, clinical psychology, but also through the lens of the animated series and, uh, and the extension of that collection. So that will be posted probably a week after Comic-Con. So very end of July, that'll be up on, um, on our show. Which I think more than likely, unless Neil, producer Neil switches things around, will be already up and available for you right now. And I will have probably already listened to it twice. So thanks to everyone else for sharing some time with us as well. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, crashingthemode.com. You can also email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And you can now find us on YouTube and Stitcher and iHeartRadio. 
If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help others find the show. And even though season three is on its way, 2019 apparently, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Hashtag buy, comic, buy YJ Comics on Comixology and get yourself up to speed for the season three premiere. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.